And uh, yeah, I'd like to, I suppose, hand over to Michael. I suppose perhaps you could sort of start by introducing yourself and um, and, and and what the, the business admissions test is all about. Thank you, Lawrence. So uh, my background is actually, I did an MBA myself many years ago for a European Asian business school called INSEAD. And like everybody else, I too had to take the GMAT to uh, prepare for admission to this school. And like many others, I spent weeks studying for it, you know, took quite a lot of time. I took quite a lot of time off work, in fact, to be able to do it. And um, when I did it too, it was also quite stressful, you know, because you feel very judged, if you know what I mean, by the, the score that you get yourself. And you just don't know, you know, you, you it takes you, then a long time to go through the application process, get a response back from the school. And I felt that the experience of all of that was uh, more stressful than it need be. So Don, I'm gonna continue. I studied my MBA at INSEAD and in INSEAD, we did a very interesting course called uh, Blue Ocean Strategy. And in Blue Ocean Strategy, what you do is, uh, you see a product that's been around for a very long time and some parts that are out of date. Some parts that remain relevant, but there's still something missing that the, the market needs and wants, and it's just not out there. So by like a reconfiguring of something which was a solution in the past, you can create a solution for the present that's uh, applicable for well into the future as well. And it usually involves getting rid of a lot of legacy inefficiency, uh, keeping the good stuff, and then adding in something that's more relevant to the audience today. So there's a reason for that anecdote. Uh, then after business school, I started a test preparation business uh, with a friend of mine who was also a graduate of INSEAD and we began it in Singapore. And uh, we ran into customers who were applying to business schools, but who had busy jobs and it seemed the more successful you were, the more you were penalized by preparing for the GMAT. Because the GMAT, quite frankly, does take a lot of time. It's a very broad curriculum of topics that you have to learn. And it's like that way because there are so many people taking it all over the world that it's become like a highly competitive sort of test where every year they're kind of notching up the difficulty just to keep a certain curve of, uh, res of uh, response going. What that then induces is an awful lot of people then will start practicing more and more in order to reach it. So you get a kind of an arms race going. Now, in 2011, INSEAD put out a call for a new kind of admissions test at the time for their executive MBA program, because that was where they were beginning to feel a, a lot of pressure from their candidates who wanted to join who just didn't have time to prepare for the other tests like the GRE or the GMAT or, or others. So we actually had a lot of experience dealing with customers in preparing them for tests. And of course, having done the test ourselves and having gone through a business school program. So we knew what you needed to be able to do to prove that you were ready for a business school program. We'd done it ourselves. We knew what was not necessary. You know, we could see all of this horrible inefficiency and dead weight built into the classic exams, the GMAT, the GRE, that had no, in, no bearing on what the content of a business school program would be. And we also began to see that there were opportunities to do some new interesting things as well with these admissions tests that would allow for a more diverse uh, constituency of people to join. So. Sometimes you could only prove, for example, your ability to think in an analytical way through mathematics. And I've, I feel that's, that's unbalanced. You know, there are people who are very good at the humanities and at communication, and they need to be able to show their analytical capabilities as well. Equally, there were some like big picture topics covered in the uh, communication side of the GRE and the GMAT but they weren't tested in a mathematical way. And I, I felt that, look, we're all you know, fairly complex people. Uh, we, we show our strengths in different ways. We should have a test that allows us to show our strengths in different ways too. Thus, the, the business admission test was born. And uh, 
what we sought to do was to reduce the workload to have to prepare for a test when you know you're not going to use this any, anymore ever again. You, you know, you should be spending months preparing for your MBA, not preparing for the admissions test. We wanted to make sure that the test would still uh, assess the same cognitive aspects of the candidate without having them to jump through hoops and memorizing English grammar or trigonometry theorems and all the stuff that you get in the classic exams. And we wanted to allow people to demonstrate their ability to think big picture and analytically in different ways. So verbal people could show their ability to analyze, quantitative people could show their ability to think in the big picture. And we've done this through adding in new kinds of questions into this format of test. And this is classic blue ocean theory, which is you know, 60, maybe 70 years ago, and it's that old, okay? The GMAT came out first. Uh, not quite sure the age of the GRE, but uh, I guess it's a similar vintage. And at the time, business school was, well, it was straight after college. And most people didn't have any work experience. They were presumed, it was an American test, so you're presumed to have come to the American education system. You were a native English speaker. And so you use familiar testing objects in order to test your academic aptitude. Of course, the world is a different place now, you know, and even business programs don't look like business programs back in the 60s. Okay, today, you know, we recognize that uh, much of our analytical work can, to some extent, you'll know, be can leverage technology. There are different roles that can do it. And your future in business is more and more to be a decision maker and a communicator. And that's something which I think is very important and which was effectively excluded from uh, assessment back in the day. Mm -hmm. So what we have is a test that is more fit for purpose for a contemporary business program. And even though we began with the executive MBA program for INSEAD, uh, it's now used for full-time MBAs, part-time MBAs, masters in finance, masters in management. Uh, it's, it's used, I'd say, in about 12 different kinds of programs in 15 uh, business schools around the world. And in fact, what's very interesting is like part of what we wanted to do is to get rid of the requirement that you be very fluent in a language, you know, because look, you know, you go to business school and you meet people from all over and usually English is their common language. But that doesn't mean that uh, they need to be perfect in it. You just need to be able to communicate and understand. So we ensured that the level of English in this test is sufficient for business. And there, when it was translated into other languages, into Spanish, Chinese, indeed, uh, French and Russian, the statistical results of performance in the test versus performance in the program were the same as for the original test in English, which shows that the test itself is quite language independent. So we feel that it's, it's a very global, international, contemporary test. You don't need to study very much for it. I mean, you can part-time study this over a couple of weeks and you will get all the familiarization you need. And then afterwards, you won't get the score on your screen because I feel that puts too much pressure on the candidate. It goes into the bag for the application for the school. And then the school will use that along with your resume and your essays to see if this is the right fit for you and for them. So I'll stop right there, Lawrence. And do you think there's something I could add more detail on? Oh, I think that's wonderful. As, as an introduction, I think that's absolutely fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, well, I you mentioned briefly at the end there, the sort of uh, the preparation time being, yeah. you mentioned two weeks there. And I know a lot of people for the GMAT will, they'll talk in months rather or years rather than weeks. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to the preparation for the test, what do you sort of recommend that uh, that people do? Sure. So I feel the best, uh, you know, so when, when we had our test prep business, we had these uh, kind of four dimensions when it comes to acing a test. And uh, one of them was understanding the landscape of what the test looks like. Because look, you know, every test is different. There's a uh an objective to a test is different to an objective to another test so i think the first thing you do is you familiarize yourself with what the test looks like you don't put yourself under pressure to 
get all the questions right or even to understand how to answer them. The first thing I would do is I would log into our platform. You can create an account for free if you wish, and you will get three practice tests that you can keep repeating as many times as you like. And what I would do is I would no pressure start the first test. There will be a timer up there, but you can pause it at least. Okay, in the real test, it may not be like that. You can't just press a button and take a break. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you got to converge on this. So get yourself familiar with the different sections in the test. Go through some of the questions and just become familiar with the appearance, become familiar with the user interface and get a handle for what the experience of taking the test looks like. For me, that's step number one. Don't stress yourself out. Take it on as like a, a nice welcome to the uh, to the test platform. Okay. Then after that, of course, take the test for real and put yourself under pressure this time to answer the questions. Now, don't worry about what your eventual score is. It's like going to the gym for the first time, maybe. Okay, do your best, and then see how you feel at the end of it. And then the next time round, you become progressively more confident. Now. I believe that by repeating the sample tests, and there are say 60 questions in each test, there are three sample tests, it's 180 questions. That's a lot of material. And that really is enough to get your brain flowing in the way that it needs to flow. Okay, you can repeat the test, you see the same questions in the practice test, but that's okay too. Because what we also want you to develop, not one of those pillars of acing a test, is confidence. Yeah, you, you need to get that feeling of, I can do this uh, about, about the test. So get the landscape right, you know, get the confidence right. Uh, as you go through it, start noting down the kinds of questions you see and what your approach to answering those questions would be. And last but not least, think about time management. You know, uh, one of the reasons why these tests are timed is because business schools want people who can process quickly. Now process quickly means when you're in the business program, you're gonna get more information than you can reasonably handle in a short amount of time. So the people who, will, who would struggle the most with a business program are those who have difficulty processing quickly. If you learn the ability to process quickly by preparing for a timed test, this puts you in a good frame of mind for business school itself. Try to avoid the stress side of it try to get into more the, the buzz of thinking and moving quickly. For me, it's all about decision making. And in business and in leadership, decision making is key. All right, you need to be confident with the decision you made based on the process by which you arrived at answering it, the data you used, and then the result that you choose. And that is what, for me, a good business admissions test should test your ability to identify the data, come up with a good process to solve it, and then be confident in your decision, and then to move on. Very right, fantastic. And I know there's a, a big industry of um, sort of GMAT prep materials and that sort of thing. Um, do you, are you able to provide sort of prep material for this test sure. or is it based yeah. purely on the on the practices? Well, like I say, you know, uh, try, try and do the best you can with the, the practice materials. There is an official guide which you can buy from the website. It's like a, a PDF and that will be emailed to you. And then for those of you who like we've had a lot of inquiries over the years about critical thinking. It's my favorite section It's the one I found the most difficult when I was uh, practicing standardized tests, but the one I love the most at the end, because I felt that was the one that helped me to think the best when it came to doing business. So we have a special video course available also on the platform. So when you log in, you will see a dashboard where you see your practice tests at the bottom, your test for your school at the top, and then another tab where you can access practice materials. There's uh, the official guide, which, you know, you can read through it in a, in a couple of days. If you do all the exercises in it and follow through, you should get through that in a couple of days more. Do the practice tests, do those over a few days, I think it's very realistic to believe that within two weeks, while still working, you'll be well prepared for this test. And all of this uh, um, uh, documentation and stuff, there's all digital, right? You don't need to worry about Absolutely. going out and buying books. Yep. 
Fantastic. Yeah. That was a yeah. quick that's little follow-up there. No problem. So yeah, Malek, I hope that answers your question. There's also a question here that's come through from uh, Thupten who asks, um, do you find that this test is more suitable for certain programs than others? For example, the executive MBA versus full-time MBA versus masters? Well, see, the interesting thing is we designed it because uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term, I'll use it. Um, the EMBA programs were the canary in the mine shaft. Okay, now the canary in the mine shaft is a term from a long time ago when they want, if something is going to kind of go wrong, you need to find it out as early as possible. So it's like the first thing to go wrong. And so the canary was this little bird and they bring it on a mine shaft and it was very sensitive to the to the gas levels in the mine shaft. And if the canary stops singing, you better get out fast, you know? So the EMBA programs were where the pressure of the preparation requirements for the GMAT, uh, along with the pressure of maintaining your career, is where the, the fracture began to show. Now, since so it was first adopted, it was the early adopters were the executive MBA programs, because this is something they really needed straight away. Now, since then, the schools that have been using for executive programs have started using it for other forms of graduate management as well. Full-time MBA, part-time MBA, masters in finance, masters in management, masters in marketing. And ultimately, I mean, the correlation between performance in the test and performance in the course is almost identical because we had two big schools do a statistical uh, study. It's almost identical to that of the GMAT. It's slightly better for quantitative and it's about the same for the overall mark. So more suitable, I would say it's just more suitable because, because you know, why, why would you have to study for months, you know, for a test that you never use again? It's still the basic concepts that you need to understand and process the content in a graduate business school, whether it's executive or full-time MBA. I'm just very pleased at how it has been adopted by more programs since then. So I, I would not say it is better for one than for another. That makes a lot of sense. I think what you said before about the sort of the impact of taking six months to study for the GMAT is it's much more of an impact when you are dealing with more senior people, aren't it? You, you know something? I won't say which business school, but it's a very well-known business school. Um, there was a person who worked for their MBA admissions department who for many years put off doing an MBA herself because she said, I don't have time to prep for the GMAT. She was in the first cohort which used this test for her school. And uh, she, you know, she's won over afterwards. She said, you know, finally, like uh, I can go through, like it's, the assessment is important for the school, right? They want to make sure that they're admitting people who can succeed on the program but it shouldn't be about turning people away. Mm -hmm. And it was definitely putting people off. And as somebody who's been a customer of the process myself, I just thoroughly disagree with the waste of life and time <laughs> in preparing for a test that you'll never use again. Fair enough. Well, um, so now I suppose we've, um, we know the why, I guess it'd be good to delve into the how, I suppose. and and. Um, so what does the sort of test experience look like? You know, what is the kind of, um, you mentioned these sort of new types of questions that mm -hmm. separate it away from standardized testing. And, and also, you know, is it broken down in the same way as the GMAT, for example, with uh, quantitative and reasoning, or is it a bit more of a mix? Great question. So um, now I'm, I'm a firm believer in you, in evolution of a product rather than total revolution because there's always some, there's always a lot of learning built into a product that's kind of arrived at where you are today. So some of the things we have kept in terms of the exam experience. So it's multiple choice, which means you don't have to write things in unless you're doing a case study, which is for very specific programs, but by and large for the, for the business admission says, you're just clicking an answer button. So, Every question has five possible answer choices. When you tap one, that immediately lodges your response in the server. So even if the internet goes down for like 30 seconds, you haven't lost any of your previous work. 
you it is not an adaptive test because i the adaptive testing was put in to make it more competitive and i just think that's just going too far come back a bit okay let's go back to why we're doing this in the first place this is to see if you're ready for business school okay it's 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 not it's not there to make you compete against other people okay so within the section there are four sections you can move back and forth within the time allotted and i think this reflects what normal business is like okay you don't have an in train and out train you can't touch one until you finish the other you know so you have the 30 minutes per section 15 questions approximately two minutes each and you can move back and forth that section as you wish what i suggest you do is that you answer the easy ones first now easy just means the ones you're most familiar with and you're most confident with get those done because you know the harder ones are going to take you more time and this is where practicing your time management comes in identify those questions where you're very confident get them done and then reallot your time to go back to the harder questions and you can go back and forth in the section just like normal task processing for a manager okay you decide what order you're going to do your set of tasks in you attack them in the manner that seems the most efficient to you and you get the job done with the resources you have to hand so it's not adaptive there are four sections 15 questions in a section now two of those sections i'll call verbal okay the first one is communication analysis and that's very familiar to everybody this is reading comprehension okay we've we've done it since primary school we get a passage and in the business admissions test you're going to get five questions per passage so they're going to be three passages five questions each so you said yourself immediately right i've got 10 minutes now really to read and absorb this text and then answer five questions afterwards not two minutes to read this and answer this question here so what I suggest you do is you first read through and get a sense for what it's all about. Again, it's familiarization. You converge on the information, reduce your stress levels, and then after that, break it down. What's the substructure here? Go through that, understand the contribution of the different parts of that. And then last time again, go through this time, scan it quickly and look for specific data points. Okay. This should be how you would analyze a document anyway at work. Okay, what's the scope? What's the theme? Uh, what's the broad structure? And then finally, what are the key points? And then after that, you should be so ready to answer the rest of the questions. And you'll see when you do the sample tests that there are a lot of similar questions come up in terms of like, what's the main idea? What's the author trying to say? Now, when I say you get repetition here, we're not making it easier for you. What we're doing is we're training you into a mindset so that in business school, you get a lot of information and you learn how to absorb it. And it can be in stages and you do so by getting through it in increasingly fine detail. And then you're confident. I've got all the information I need. I've got the structure in my head. Now I can communicate and analyze based on what I see. So the first section is communication analysis. Second section is critical thinking. So like I say, this is my favorite one. Uh, I think it's the most powerful one. It's the one that sets people apart in decision making. Do you know what's a fact? Do you know what you can take for granted in a discussion? Do you know what is not confirmed? Do you know what is assumed without state without saying and do you know what it means to draw a conclusion? Because that's the basis of what your further actions will be taken. So this is very much a question of logic and communication all at once. It's, it can be very hard. And the trick is to understand, you know, when you are, your brain is filling in the blanks for you and you're making assumptions and you train yourself into identifying where the holes are in the argument. It's okay if you don't have all the information it's necessary that you know when you don't have all the information and when you make a decision later you do so on the basis of knowing which information you can count on which information you're taking for granted 
And you can also decide when you don't have enough information at all to make a decision. I think it's very, very important because so much of your life as a business person is just making go, no go decisions. People will come to you and they'll be almost prepared and you need to be able to know when you need more information. It's much better than saying yes, just to push it forward. And it's still better than saying no, which communicates if you like the wrong reaction. What you need to be able to do is say, there's something that we still need to work on. We need to fill in this data. We need this information to arrive at a conclusion. And uh, I believe it's the most powerful of the four sections. Next one is data interpretation. So, you know, you're going through business school, you get information in a lot of different formats. Typical example of this is the case study, right? They'll write down a bunch of text, They'll give you some diagrams, they'll give you a table, there'll be some information kind of written at the end as well in bullet points. This is the mess of information you are given. And from that, you have to understand what's going on and you have to derive a result somehow. So data interpretation is all about that. There's a strong emphasis on graphical information. There's a strong emphasis on mixed formats of information. So like I say, some graphical, some tabular, some written, and uh, some, some, sometimes it's just like bullet points or it could even be a paragraph. And your job is to be able to visualize all of the uh, information and what its context is and translate that into uh, a model that will give you the solution in the end. So, you know, it's exciting. You know, I mean, this is the, the sort of skill that you will be picking up through immense practice in your business school program. And now is a good time to get started at it when you, when you, when you go for this admissions test. You don't need to do trigonometry. You don't need to understand grammar rules in English. But what you do need are skills you will reuse later. The last section is called data analysis. And really, this is uh, arithmetic. How comfortable are you with numbers? What we discovered over the years was there are some people who still have a certain lack of comfort when it comes to numbers. And this is just helping them to just focus on the calculations themselves. And in particular, focus on detail of calculations. You know, like just this morning, I reviewed a document called a term sheet. And in this term sheet, there was a an amount of money that the firm was valued at before the money came in, then there was an investment amount, and then there was the resulting equity percentage for the investor afterwards. And there was a glaring error in this, which if you're skimming the document, you wouldn't really think about. But through doing problems like in data analysis, you automatically start doing calculations in your head. Most of the calculations you do in business are multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. Let's be honest, okay? So, and you will see a lot of those in legal documents, in contracts, and you need to be happy and familiar with the idea of just plugging them into your head, coming up with a number and checking results as you go along. So for me, data analysis is that skill that you build up in doing due diligence and numbers. So those are the four main multiple choice questions in the business admissions test. Now, for some programs, usually executive MBA programs, we also have a case study. So that case study is, look, this is also from my own experience applying to business school. Uh, we're given all these darn trigonometry and grammar tests to get into business school, but what about a business case? You know, I mean, we're going for business school. So I thought it's a great opportunity to allow candidates to review a business situation and to give their views on it. What's happening, what would I do? And for executive programs, this is very useful to see what the style of the candidate is in a classroom setting where communication and exchange of experiences are very much part of the program. And um, so you have all of these, you know, these four sections, is the weighting on those equal throughout? Or? Yes, so the four multiple choice questions generate their a separate numerical uh, score. Each question in the test is weighted the same. Okay. Uh, each question, every section is weighted the same. You don't get negative marking, which I just think is all wrong. You know, so you're scored on what you deliver. 
and uh, you choose, like I said, you go back to those, you always start with the questions where you're most confident. And actually that was a little trick I think I picked up in primary school with a great teacher who understood everybody learns at a different pace. And so she let us choose the parts of the curriculum we are most confident with, get through that, and start building up the difficulty progressively. So I think when you're doing this test, you have the same sort of attitude. You've done some familiarization with questions already. Find the ones you're very confident with, get them out of the way, and then start building your score up that way. And look, some people are good at this, some people are good at that. So that's why I don't think it makes an awful lot of sense to weight questions differently. What you want, again, is diversity in your program, diversity of thought, diversity of talents. So you need to allow a diverse group of people to get to a, an acceptable score. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. And I, I think from a school perspective as well, we would always, GMATs are sometimes hard. We sort of, you can use them as a, as a test of a mathematic ability, but it's, um, you know, it does mean that we then we everyone applies their own bias to how much they weigh the quantitative versus the non-quantitative questions. So having a slightly um, uh, leveler playing field definitely is a, is a positive thing. Well, well, yes. And like I say, you know, in the, in the, in like in the GMAT, they don't test your kind of uh, analytical skills uh, well in the verbal part. They don't test your big picture skills at all in the quantitative part. So what we've done is we've sort of cross mixed those kinds of questions so that uh, people do get to show their strengths in different ways, which is just how people are, you know? Oh, definitely. Um, and so when it comes to the sort of the lived experience of taking the test, um, you know, you sit down in front of a computer, uh, are there any sort of restrictions on sure. apps that people can use, you know, Excel calculators, that sort of thing? Okay. So, you know, when you do your practicing at home, you're just doing that in a regular browser, you can even do the questions on a phone as well. It's fine. When you do the test itself, well, you know, there is a certain level of uh, responsibility required of the people who take the test. You know, you're, you're being assessed. It's, it's, it's for your benefit as well as everybody else's that you are as honest as possible with what you do. So that means you go in, you, sh you shouldn't have to stress out too much about this test, okay? It's not so high stakes that you should be paying someone to take the test for you or anything. You, you're, this crazy stuff happens with high stakes tests where there's so much money involved. So that we want to get rid of all that. But what we do want is for you to be the person who's there and not be communicating with anybody and not using tools that would give you an advantage over somebody who doesn't have those tools. So what we did is we built a special program. It's basically our own browser, but with extra permissions that allow us to record the desktop screen. So your desktop screen, since you start taking the test, will be recorded all the time. If you've like a second monitor, it records the second monitor too. Or I've even seen three monitors going <laughs> at the past. Uh, but the point is that, uh, you know, we, we don't suspect people, but we just want people to remember that you will be supervised in this fashion. And also your webcam will be on you all the time. So like you see Lawrence and myself here, this, this will be recorded as well in the test. You'll be taken on a computer, most likely a laptop with a webcam, and you should be there all the time looking at it. What we, this is recorded. And what we do is we scrub through it later to see, are you communicating with anybody? You know, we also do the same with this desktop recording. The application, when it's running, it will warn you you're not supposed to be using anything else if you move to uh, another application. So please don't. If you want to do calculations, get a nice little hand calculator, right? You'll only need to do multiplication, addition, division, subtraction, all right? avoid using any tools that will give you what we think is too much of an advantage like say excel like it'll just make it messy then because we'll see that you've been using this and then the school will have to make a choice you know do we admit this candidate even though we feel they've been given an unfair advantage it's best that you stick with pencil paper normal calculator don't talk to anybody don't message anybody while you're online and you'll be fine.
So we'll record your desktop and your webcam throughout. And then, so do most people, do they end up taking the test from home or? Most people, well, the, the, the places you can take are basically anywhere with an internet connection. So most people do take it from home. A couple have taken it, I guess, at work, like inside in a closed office. Some schools have hosted candidates to say, come in, visit the school for a half a day, sit to test while you're here. You know, not, nice experience. But by and large, people take it at home, usually in their living rooms or their bedrooms. Mm -hmm. Just make sure that you won't be distracted and that somebody else isn't standing next to you while you're taking the test. Uh, bear in mind the needs of your body, you know. So if you drink lots of water earlier, go to the toilet before you start the test. Uh, have, have plenty of food, you know, like half an hour before. And these things matter, you know because it's two hours of intense activity so you need to make sure you got enough sugar in your bloodstream you know enough slow release carbs uh, enough water hydrating you so that you don't suffer any kind of mental fatigue or fogginess and make sure that you're in your best position so do your practice tests i would say in the same place you take the live test so there's almost nothing different between taking a practice test and a live test on the day. Well, it's very nice to hear really, because I mean, I know that there are other tests that have much more strict rules. If, if you're doing it online, you can only use a sort of whiteboard and marker and you're not allowed calculators and you can't bring water into various test centers, things like that. But um, yeah, it's I know, nice know, but I mean, I, I find that this is a very reactionary kind of attitude. Like I, I'm trust, but verify if you know what I mean. And and that is what this program is about, or sorry, this, this thing is all about. I, I just feel it's all wrong to put our customers under such pressure when it's A, accusatory, and B, irrelevant, you know, most of the time. Mm -hmm. We have discovered people who are, shall we say, breaking the rules, very few, but we have found them, and it is straightforward to do so. We don't feel that the candidates should be put under stress or be, you know what I mean, kind of be accused before the fact or taking the test. We trust, but we verify. Fantastic. Well, we have uh, a bit of time left. So if anyone has any uh, questions to come through for Michael, then um, yeah, absolutely send them through now. Um, Michael, I don't suppose, do you have by any chance, maybe a, an example question or anything that you could show us? I don't know sure. if you have something available. But. Yeah. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to log into the platform. Actually, yeah. And uh, I'll find a user that I can use, a candidate. And yes, because I suppose it would be good to uh, to give people a bit of an idea about what the what the, the platform looks like, you know, sure. to sort of expect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose I should say as well, just uh, whilst Michael's doing this, so for anyone who is interested in taking the test, um, for anyone who has sort of uh, identified perhaps one of our programs or even a program at a different school um, that is offering this as a test as an alternative to a GMAT or a GRE, then the easiest way to get hold of this material is to get in touch with your admissions manager. Um, so which for us would be um, you know, one of our admissions team, Olga or, or, or uh, Roxy or, Ste or Stephanie or, or Boban or anyone else on, on the team. Um, and they'll be able to send through uh, various links. So things to uh, the practice tests, the preparation material, all that sort of thing. So can yeah. you tell me what you see here, uh, Lawrence, in your screen? Do you see? I see a Michael Collins profile with my tests and okay, very good. materials yeah, yeah. Oh, excellent so um okay so when you create you can create a free user profile yourself or what happens 90 percent of the time is the school invites you and then that puts you in the workflow where you confirm your email address put in your name you can put up a profile photo if you like and then you get to somewhere that looks a bit like this so this is for somebody who's applying to a school you can see you got some practice tests here. Uh, for those of you who want to get the official guide, it's here. And um, we, all, we also have uh, videos which you can check out as well. But let's just go through what a test looks like. So let's go through practice test number one. Of course, it starts off and it tells you like very straightforward, you know, 
make sure you got a good internet connection and uh you know it's the basic test got basic test sections are this and you just have to progress through by hitting next so we're going to start the test and here we see the first question so look at the most important thing i want you to see straight away is this timer on the top right you see that there lawrence mm -hmm, I do. okay so that timer tells you how many how many minutes you've got remaining and you can see up at the top here uh, how many questions there are in the section you can see there are 15 in the section when you answer a question you just tap it like this and bingo it stores the answer on the server and you're done if you change your mind of course you can just comment tap another one and that will update it for you even if you go down later on in the test and you say oh you know something i'm going to go back and change that one you can do that so you'll go here and you change it to this and then you proceed so you can then see you know how many questions have answered the color changes you can see where you are and if you look at the number there always say to yourself right how am i doing for time if you see ones that you think you can answer very quickly answer those quickly and try and build up as much time for the hard ones as later. Try and answer an easy question in a minute. So I've, I've been talking now for only a minute and a quarter since the test began, but I've clicked around a lot. If you're very familiar with the test format, then you should be able to answer an easy question in well under a minute. That gives you an extra minute for a hard question later. Okay, so I'll go through all these questions here. I'm just a answering randomly by the way this is not a uh, a means to judge <laughs> what the actual answers are these must and be this, very easy questions if oh, you're asking yeah, so quickly me, you so quickly um so yeah i'm just gonna go through the test the live test looks just like the practice test just no difference so that's why it's good to do the practice test in order to be able to familiarize yourself with the environment and i think that's very important and here we go i'm going to get through all of this i'm going to eventually answer all the questions and once you come to the end of a section all right you see the button next section here and what i do is now i can if i want go back and check everything right no problem maybe i'll make a note when i'm doing question eight not sure like in my notes go back and check again i can go back and do it i can change the answer if i change my mind and then I can just go to the next section when I'm done. So when I go to the next section, now it's important, you can go back and forth within a section, but you can't go between sections. So once you finish the section, that's it. You said, I've now demonstrated my skill areas in this section here. I'm gonna leave that section. And it says, are you sure? Let's just say, I go, no, no, wait a sec. So I can go back again. And then I go, okay, next section goes, are you sure? Okay, so I go through, bingo, timer starts again. Now I'm on to critical thinking. Okay, I can't go back to the old section, but that's all right. I've done my best there. So, same sort of feeling again. So now I'm going to speed things up a bit, if you don't mind. You can see now uh, in data interpretation, you get that mixture of data formats. Okay, and uh, that's that's what I mean by like, you know, having different kinds of information given to you, right? So here's like some uh, text uh, with some graphical information across different dimensions. There's some more uh, information here written down. That's a lot of information you've got to figure out what to do with. Uh, then we've got uh, your standard, you know, data sufficiency questions, or as we call them, in information completeness, I prefer that term. These take a, a lot of practice to get them right, but once you do, you start thinking about how much information you have. You know, like pre like in, in the GMAT, they have these style questions, but only for verbal. Whereas we have them for oh, sorry, only for quant, but we have them for verbal as well. Because I, I think you can show your ability to think logically in two different ways. All right, so now we're on to data analysis. And as you can see, it's all about just mental arithmetic. You've got to develop this kind of skill for reviewing documents. You know, quick check on a person in a conversation, they're telling you about prices, 
you need to be able to do the maths in your head. And a great way of doing that is to through the skills of data analysis. Now, I'm going to finish this section. For those of you who would be doing the case study, you'd get something like this. I like the case studies. Uh, they're written by our guys uh, in the team. And uh, they usually deal with a small business that's uh, facing uh, change. And you get a lot of information about the company, the background, the people who are in it, the financials, you know, a couple of years of profit and loss and balance sheet. You do need to understand how those things work and what the competition looks like. You can put in your answers, you know, at the bottom. It'll save it automatically for you. And uh, then when you've finished, when you're doing the practice test, you get this, okay? And it tells you, okay, you got so many right, so many wrong. And this is for you to scratch your chin and say, okay, what, how could I have done better? It'll show you the ones you got right, okay, and the ones you got wrong. And you pick one you got wrong, and it'll give you what the correct answer should have been. Now, it's not going to give you a written solution. And there's a reason for that. Remember, this is about training yourself. You've got to be able to make the connections yourself. We're saying, okay, you, you chose this, but you should have chose that. Now try and rationalize where the answer came from. So we've come a bit closer to you, but we're not going to hold your hand to get to the answer. We believe you can figure this out for yourself. Now you can do the sample tests as many times as you like. You can retake them. Uh, I suggest you do do it a few times. And uh, that's it. I mean, the live test looks just like this. And when you do a live test, there'll be a button up here saying take test. It'll be above the, the official guide one. And uh, when you do that, if you're paying for the test, you'll just go to a page where it asks you to put in your credit card details. Stripe is the platform we use. Great platform built by two Irish farmers who moved to America and now they're worth tens of billions each. True story. And uh, the, um, then once you've paid for the test, you can take it any time. Now, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a second. And uh, when you take the test, what you do is you, you download an app. Actually, you know, I'll share again. I'll just show you where to get that app. So can you see that again, Lawrence? Yes. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So you see here it says business test methods app. If you've got a Windows program, you just download it straight away and you install it. If it's on the App Store for Macintosh, you go to the App Store and the App Store will have it there for you and it's installed through your, Win your Apple operating system. When you log on, you'll see actually if I if you go to this here, this page here, you know, it, it gives you some screenshots. It'll test your internet connection on your webcam. It'll take your photo and a photo of your ID. You then log in with the same login that you've been using all along. Now you can't paste in anything in here. You gotta type it all in, so be careful. And uh, then you get the test and it starts off and it looks just the same as the test you've seen before. And that, my friends, is it. And when, you, when the test is over, Lean back in your chair, <laughs> have a drink of water or whatever. And uh, then Lawrence or whoever in the SMT will receive an email saying that you have just finished the test and they will click the link and it will show your report. And then they will process the application after that. So That's if the... you want to know how you did, contact the school. If you have technical issues, contact us. And the way to contact us is, you know, you've got our email address, uh, info btmethods.com will do. All right, so contact those, that number there, and we'll be right back to you straight away. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. I know it's a very comprehensive um, run through. Actually, I've never actually seen the platform myself, so it's, ah, uh, it's very okay. cool to see it. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> sign up, take a few tests, you might even like it. Absolutely. Well, um, so speaking of uh, contact details, I think now is probably uh, a reasonably good time to um, to wrap up. So 
uh, I am just going to very quickly share our contact details as well. So if you are interested in learning a bit more, if you're interested in taking the test as part of your application, then admissions.degrees at esmt.org is the uh, uh, the contact information to get through to. That comes through to our office just next door. Um, anyway, I think um, now is probably a good time to wrap up, but I do have one uh, final question for you, Michael. So um, if there was like one kind of top tip that you could give uh, a candidate for, for how to sort of do best at the test, um, what yeah. would that be? Keep retaking the practice tests. You know, do as I said in the beginning, uh, start just by familiarizing yourself with the environment. Don't worry about getting them right necessarily. Then focus on trying to get to the right answer and retake it and try and get to the right answer quickly and develop a sense of confidence in yourself and recognition of questions that you're familiar with so that you can answer those quickly and uh, leave time then for the harder ones later. Okay. Don't worry about getting uh, them all right in succession, you know, just uh, try and get the ones right that you can get right. And uh, if the one that looks like it's going to be just too hard for now, go through the rest and come back to that later. And a great way to do that is practice, practice the practice tests. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate you coming along to um, share your expertise. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone else, for joining us today. Um, we do a number of these online events and we're actually going to be doing one in a couple of months with uh, someone talking through the GMAT and the GRE so you'll hear the other side of the coin I guess um, but yeah take a look uh, at our um, join us online uh, webinar webpage and you'll see what's coming up hopefully there should be lots that's uh, appropriate there anyway thank you very much Michael and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon bye everyone bye bye